During my time hunting here in New Zealand, I realized just how differently different countries approach wildlife conservation and natural resource management. It has made me especially appreciative of our own management strategy in the U.S. where wildlife is viewed as a public resource. Hunting and fishing in North America and the management of the wildlife and fisheries upon which our lifestyle depends is characterized by a unique management and regulation system known as the North American model of wildlife conservation. The Europeans who first settled and explored our continent had all come from cultures where wildlife and wild lands were the property of the elite landed gentry. The development of our nation was largely driven by North America's incredible wealth of renewable natural resources. There were few restrictions and the free access of the public to exploit these resources was critical in building the United States and Canada. Today, the abundance of wildlife that we enjoy and its conservation and management are a reflection of the historic access to natural resources that our forefathers enjoyed. The combination of unrestricted access and the subsequent potential for overuse led to the founding of the wildlife conservation movement in the late 19th century and, ultimately, the codification of the North American model. There are seven underlying principles upon which the North American conservation model is based. First, wildlife is a public trust resource. It is not owned by individuals, but is held in trust by the government for the benefit of present and future generations. The second principle is the elimination of commercial markets for wild game. Historically, unregulated and unsustainable commercial harvests of game animals and migratory birds led to federal and state laws that greatly restricted the sale of meat and other parts from these animals. These restrictions have been so successful in restoring game populations that today we enjoy something of an overabundance of some species, such as white-tailed deer and snow geese. Third, we allocate the use and harvest of wildlife by law. As a trustee, government manages wildlife in the interest of the beneficiaries, the present and future generations of the American public. Laws and regulations establish frameworks under which decisions can be made. These frameworks enable us to make decisions, such as which species can be hunted and which species cannot be taken because of their rarity or endangerment. The fourth principle holds that wildlife can only be taken for legitimate purposes. The slaughter of our game for frivolous purposes will not be tolerated. Most states and Canadian provinces have forms of wanton waste laws that require hunters to salvage as much meat as possible from legally killed game. The fifth principle recognizes wildlife as an international resource. A milestone in the implementation of this concept was the signing of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act in 1916. In addition to the realization that waterfowl had to be managed across international boundaries, the protection of migratory songbirds was seen as critical in the protection of agricultural crops against insect pests. This act was the first to affect many more species than just those that were hunted and was the first treaty to provide for international management of our wildlife resources. The next principle holds that management of our wildlife resources should be accomplished through science-based rather than purely emotional standards. The application of this principle has led to most of the advances in the management of a diverse array of wild animals and migratory birds. The last, and I would argue the most important principle underlying the North American model of conservation is what we call the democracy of hunting. Theodore Roosevelt believed that society at large would benefit if all people, regardless of origin or class, had access to opportunities for hunting. It is this concept that distinguishes the United States and Canada from many other nations where the opportunities to hunt are restricted to those who have special status, such as land ownership or wealth. Those of us who've grown up hunting and fishing often take this for granted, but it's worthwhile every now and then to stop and think about how fortunate we are to live in a society where our wildlife resources are collectively ours to use and enjoy. If you wanna find out more about what you can do to help secure hunting and fishing rights for future generations of sportsmen, please pay a visit 
to the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership website at www.trcp.org.